Okay, so we have already considered a bunch of different methods uh, that were basically methods of classification and progression. So we were considering uh, so-called supervised learning. Uh, today we are, trans uh, we are transferring to another branch of machine learning and we are starting uh, considering different methods of unsupervised learning. The, the method I want to present you today is called principal component analysis. Probably you have already heard something about this method, but today we will consider that a little bit in depth and I will show you maybe one or two examples how to use that and how, do, how can we consider this method, how, how can we create that on our own and how do we use this method uh, from ST Learn. PCA is a is fundamentally that is a dimensionality reduction algorithm, but of course it can be also useful, very useful uh, for uh, visualization, for noise filtering, and feature extraction and engineering. What is the for the first and the foremost motivation for us of creating of creating such sort of algorithms? So we want to reduce the number of dimensions. Why do, uh, do we want to do, to do that? How do you think? Uh, probably to have less data to work with and uh, to have uh, some uh, uh, Analysis of of, of of the data, like of what what exactly matters in it. Did you heard the term a curse of dimensionality? Yes, I oh. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, curse of dimensionality is the problem that many of our algorithms especially our uh, minimization algorithms, they become intractable when we get to uh, some high, uh, higher dimensional input. So the more dimensions we have, in general, uh, the worse will our methods perform. And so it's really interesting for us to have a method that may transfer some multi-dimensional problem into some lower dimensions and then we can apply some different methods on top of that. And that will be very useful for us because these methods will perform better, better on uh, some lower dimensional input. And we are getting that lower dimensional input by having some sort of dimensionality redu uh, reduction methods. And in this case, it's PCA. Well, sometimes later, probably I will show you some more powerful methods so-called manifold learning methods. But today we, we stick with uh, principal component analysis. What else can be useful for you uh, when you are reducing your dimensions? Uh, for example, you want to visualize your data. How many dimensions can you draw, basically? Well, probably two, yeah? Maybe in some cases you can draw some sort of projection of three dimensions. But that's that's all. That's all what we have. We cannot get outside three dimensions. So if we want to visualize some higher dimensional data, it's really nice to have a method that can somehow squeeze all that dimensions into two or three dimensions, and then we can draw that. So then we can have our data set somehow visualized and probably draw some conclusions from that data set or search uh, for something in there. And the third uh, and the third thing we are interested in is noise reduction. So we can reduce uh, noise by eliminating some uh, dimensions uh, that mostly contain noise. And I will show you how that works uh, because in some sense we are changing the coordinate uh, system and by changing this coordinate system, we achieve the sort of situation 
when we expect some of the coordinates contain mostly data and some other coordinates contain mostly noise and we are trying then to get rid of that noisy coordinates okay now let's look what happens uh, so here is an example of of noise elimination uh, here's my data set uh, these are some data points that are living in two-dimensional space. We have two dimensions. Each of them is a feature. Each data point uh, contains two features, feature 1 and feature 2. When we are considering these features, uh, we see that they are somehow scattered on this plane. And now what I'm thinking about is about changing these coordinates. Where does the idea of changing coordinates come from? So when we are considering, well, I, I guess I should draw that. So probably I will try somehow. So let me consider a very simple situation. So here's my space. I have two features. So this is feature one. This is feature two. And my data set, suppose that it looks like this. So these are my two features. So how do you think which one of these features is more is more useful for us? Feature one or feature two? Why? Let me put it this way. So suppose I will later use these point for some sort of I don't know, classification problem. This would mean I will give each of these points a tag uh, that it belongs to, I don't know, class A or class B. So suppose some some of them I'm tagging uh, with, I don't know, with a check mark. So this one, this one, I don't know, this one. And the others I don't tag with anything. So these are my two classes. Cool. So some data points are tagged, some are not. Now let's consider these features one, uh, once again. Which of them will be useful for me to classify these points? Yes, the first one will be useful for me. The second one will be not. Why? Because they are, they are all projected into almost the same value. So I don't see any difference between these points if they are all projected into the exactly the same value. So I don't have anything, you, I can't get anything useful from the feature too. But I can at least try to get something useful from feature one because they have different values along this feature. So probably I can at least try to construct some classifier they, that will take these points and find somehow their classes. So here is the crucial idea. Looking at these points, what is the main difference between these two features when we are looking at the data set? What is so different between these features? Yes. Absolutely correct. So large variance along one feature and almost no variance along another feature. So probably we can suppose, and in most cases, at least in today's lecture, we will suppose that variance contains some information, some useful information. Of course, it may contain some sort of noise that may happen. Yeah. 
but we will suppose that the more variance we have in a feature, the more it contains some sort of useful information. So the easier for us is to get something out of there. So to make some sort of classification or, or regression or whatever we want. If we have some very low variance, these, this means the data is almost constant and we cannot get anything useful out of there. So that's what we have. So now let's consider this picture once again. Here we have, uh, so here we, we have our data set and we have two features. At this point, I cannot throw away uh, feature one or feature two. Well, just because I have uh, some sort of variance, some large variance, along each of these features. But you might guess that choosing a right coordinate system, choosing some good coordinate system, I can make one of these features make a variance along it much, much smaller than along the, diff uh, the other one. And here is an example of such a coordinate system that I will get with principal component analysis. So here is my coordinate number one, and here is coordinate number two. And I see that uh, this variance is much smaller. And I can even suppose that if this is some sort of small variance, maybe this feature tends to be a constant. And probably all this variance is caused by some sort of noise. And I may even think about removing this feature. And I remove that by basically projecting all the points on these uh, on the other axis so here here we have it so i projected everything on one direction that is the maximum var variation direction and probably in this way i have some sort of reduce my noise in the data set the second thing uh, that we achieve with uh, this sort of method is so-called correlation elimination. So if I have features, if I have a data set that looks like this, I have some sort of correlation between my features, between feature one and feature two. You Hopefully you remember, so what is a correlation? What is a correlation coefficient? The measure of linear dependence between features. Yes, yes. So it basically measures how good my uh, features are lying on some sort of line. And when I'm choosing a different coordinate system, well, I will try to reproduce probably a few more data sets. So if I have data set that looks like this. So here's once again, feature one, feature two. What, what kind of correlation coefficient do I expect in this situation? Yeah, so that will be approximately, let's call it row, it will be approximately plus one. If I have some sort of this situation. Mm -hmm. 
what do I expect here? Yes, so something approximately minus one. And the interesting thing, what kind of correlation coefficient do I expect in here? In this case, yes. So in this case, they are uncorrelated. So this is approximately zero. So choosing wisely my coordinate system, you can see that basically it's the same data set. I have just some sort of rot rotated my coordinate system and I can get from here to here and from here to here just by, by rotation. It's a very simple linear transformation and I can get from one of these data sets to another. And you see that when here I have my features strongly correlated, in this case, I have almost no correlation. So it's close to, the, uh, to zero. And that's really good because many of our methods, they don't like correlated features. So most cases, you would like your features to be independent. At least if you remember, I don't know, about let's say bias classifier or something like that. Uh, you can recall that we didn't want our features to be somehow correlated uh, or something like that. We want some sort of independence because we wanted, for example, to have naive bias. And in many different cases, you would like to have the same situation. So you would like your features to be independent. And that's why you will need to do something with correlation. And this is the method that allows you to get away with that. Okay, so these are uh, basically the ideas of what we want to get when we are doing something with uh, principal component analysis. Now let's try to get some intuitive ideas. How do we perform that uh, analysis and basically see how that looks like. So here is a demo for you. So here I have a data set, some, some random points. So suppose they look like this. And here I have my coordinate axis and I can move these axes around. I can move them, I can ro rotate them. And here on the, on the right, you see the projections of these points onto these axes. So depending on how do I position these axes, how do I change my coordinate system, we will get different projections. When I'm just translating this around, they are just moving along these, let's say, these axes separated. So these projections are just translated. But when I'm rot rotating my axis, you see that variance changes. And it can change drastically along one or the other of these axes. And at some point, I can position my axis in a way that the variance along one of the axis is the biggest possible. So I can try all different angles. I can rotate this 360 degrees. And at some point, I will get the biggest variance I can. That will mean that I, ha I had positioned my axis in a way to perform the PCA procedure. So right now, one of my axes has acquired the ability to have the biggest possible variance. If I had more axes, I could perform this procedure once again and again and again until I exhaust all axes and I will get first the biggest variance along axis number one. Then I'm trying to rotate all the rest axes to get the biggest variance along axis number two and so on and so forth. And that's why I will have some axes having very large variance, and I will have some other axes having 
some small variance. And if we stick to the idea that variance in our data means some sort of amount of information that we have in our data, we will basically understand that some of the axes the, that have some small variance, they can be, for example, safely removed. And uh, in this way, we will perform some sort of uh, dimensionality reduction. So we will have some smaller number of dimensions, and we can use that either for passing these data to some different algorithms, and our algorithms will perform better because we will get rid of the uh, curse of dimensionality that will really help us. Or we can try even to grow that. So we are, for example, we are trying to squeeze everything into two or maximum three dimensions, and we can draw that on, on screen. So that's, that's the way. OK, uh, let's get a little bit more technical and look what we, what we can get with formulae. Here is, here is some sort of uh, example. Uh, how do we calculate all the things? If you remember, and hopefully you can recall that, when we were performing linear regression, we have constructed some sort of matrix where we were keeping all our data set just by putting the, putting all that uh, data points into the matrix uh, like line by line. So I had different lines in that matrix, different rows, and each row uh, was corresponding to different data point. In this case, we are doing something very similar, uh, but for some, let's say, historical reasons, I will put my uh, data points not row by row, but column by column. So here I have different columns in my matrix, and each of these columns corresponds to one data point. So if I have some data point in that multidimensional space, here is the vector that basically describes its position. Of course, you might guess that each row of this matrix will now correspond to one feature. So when I am considering my data points in the first slot of each of these vectors of the data points, I have some feature number one. And that's why I will get a, the whole row of, uh, of this uh, feature number one values. What do I do there? I am performing so-called of centralization. If you have seen in the uh, demo, nothing changes when I am translating my axis. So basically variance does not change. Of course, my projections translate, but it's not very, let's say, meaningful. Yeah, variance does not change. And that will be very helpful for me if I will put this axis into the center of mass of these uh, data points. You can recall very similar thing when performing linear regression. We always had our regression line passing through the center of mass. So center of mass is a really nice point with nice properties. And that helps us to make our formulae a little bit less complicated. So to perform uh, the centralization, I am just subtracting from each feature its mean value. So I can get through row number one, calculate mean value, and then create some sort of new matrix, which has the first row with the same number. And this number is the mean value of the feature one. Uh, the same thing with feature number two, and so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, I get this matrix that is called a centralization matrix, and I can subtract it from my matrix that contains my raw data. After that, I can multiply everything by inverse uh, values of uh, STD. So I want uh, each my feature to have uh, more or less equal uh, variance. This part can be performed or can be not depending on the situation. So you want centralize always if you are calculating this thing. Normalization matrix uh, you can apply or in some cases you may think maybe not apply. That, that depends. Mostly you will probably want to apply it. 
Okay, what do we get at the end of the day? Now I'm looking, how do I perform a PCA on whatever I have in here? Uh, so I have uh, this matrix A, I have performed some operations on my, my data, and now I know that the center of mass of these points coincides with the origin of coordinate axis. Uh, so now the problem of finding axis for PCA has basically reduced to the problem of rotating the axis so, uh, so that I get maximal variance along one of the axes. So I need just to rotate them. How do I do that? Let me probably, uh, let me probably draw something in the whiteboard. That's that's a little simple, but anyway, I want to show that to you. Okay, so here I have my coordinate system, and here I have my data points scattered somehow like this. And the first and the foremost thing to notice for you, please note that if I calculate variance along this axis and this axis, what do I get? Will they be very different or not? Show Hello? again which axis. So here, here is my axis, one axis. So let's call it, I don't know, let's call it X and let's call this one Y. So I want to calculate my variance along axis X and along axis Y. Will they be very different or not? So I will calculate that, get some numerical yeah. values. Uh, yes, uh, they are very different. Why? Similar uh, because uh, I, 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 I thought you know, that variance along x axis and variance along y axis or, or I misunderstood. Yeah, so consider that I am projecting these points on the x-axis, I get something like this. I am projecting these points along y-axis, I will get something like this. So if I will put oh, them so side, side by side, for example, I put x and y in here, I will get my projections like this and like this. Do they look very different? Oh, I guess no. No. I guess they don't. So you have almost the same variance along x axis and along y axis. Why am I stressing this point so much? I don't want you to be confused with that with the part where I have my matrix normalized. Because you might think, well, if you have somehow performed that sort of normalization, so I have transformed my data points in a way that I have almost equal variance along each of the axes, then why am I performing any of that PCA? What can it found? What what can it find there? So is there anything useful to, to consider? So I want you to show this case where you clearly see 
that I can have almost the same variance along y-axis, along x-axis, but here is still something to search for, because of course I can rotate these axes and get some new coordinate system, for example, looking like this, so having like x prime and y prime in here, and I will get much more variance now along x-axis than along y-axis. So here is some sort of knot I want to entangle for you. So please don't be confused with, uh, with that part that I am normalizing something. Yes, I am normalizing that. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't render my PCA useless. Because I can still have this sort of the situation so that my points are somehow correlated. And I can still gain something from the rotation of the axis. So that's what I have. So is this point more or less clear for you? So do you have some sort of intuitive feeling? What are we trying to do? Yes. Okay, so now let's get a little bit more to uh, the uh, formulae. Once again, let me refresh these data sets. So here are my coordinate axes. Here's once again my data set. Now what I'm trying to do, I'm searching for a direction that I can project all these points onto, and I want to measure and I want to have the direction uh, that will give me the maximal variation for the projection of these points. So I am taking some sort of vector in here. Let's call it, I don't know, let's call it vector x. And I will try to project all my points on the line that is defined by this vector. So here is my line. And I'm trying to project all these points on that line. So for example, I will show you one projection. Let's say this one. And all the rest are projected as well. And now I want to calculate my variance of whatever I have in here. How is that performed? So if I have my matrix of A, it basically, it contains data on how these points are positioned in this coordinate system. So each of the columns of matrix A is basically my data point. So here is my data point one, so call it, I don't know, D1. Here is my data point two, it's D2, and so on and so forth up to dn, where n is the size of my data set. Now what will happen if I will multiply my vector x, I will take it, for example, x transpose, and I will multiply that by my matrix A. So what do I have in here? So here is my vector x that has some sort of coordinates. It's, it's transpose. So here it here are its coordinates, and here is my matrix A that contains my data points. Since I'm multiplying basically row by column, I will get, at the end of the day, I will get a vector. What it will be, vector row or vector column? Yes, vector row. So I will get a vector row that will contain uh, inside values of x scalar product with d1, x scalar product 
with v2, so on and so forth. If my vector x is unitary, so it has unit length, I can say that all these, whatever I have in here, it's the length of the projections uh, of these data points onto my line along x. So this length, some L, I don't know, let's it be the point I, so this is L I, and I will have somewhere in here, I will have somewhere L I equals to X times V I. So that's what, what I basically have, some, some numbers in here. Now, if I want to get a variance, what should I do? What kind of calculation should I perform to get the variance of these numbers? So these numbers are basically positions of my projections along this line. That's really good. Now I only need to, to have a variance of this thing. What should I do? Uh, multiply the variances by the fact. So I, I need where uh, here are some numbers. Project, from, I okay, know, okay, one, okay, ten. Can, we, can we project the variances in same way in the same way in same way or or, or should separately calculate? No, I'm afraid it's not the way it works. So we will need to calculate them from scratch. But it's not a big deal because you already have these numbers. So this will be some numbers. I don't know, some number, I don't know, some number five three and a half, and so on and so forth, seven and 14. So these are just numbers because I have performed scalar multiplication and I have numbers in here. If you have a bunch of numbers, how do you calculate variance? What is variance uh, by definition? We should sum a uh, difference between the h, h value and the mean and divide by number of samples. But squared, yes? Yes, yes, squared. So if, yeah, so if I have a bunch of some numbers, some numbers, I don't know, numbers, um, let's call them A, so I should, from each AI, I should subtract the mean value of all these A's I should make it squared, and I should divide that by the number of all these a's. So something like this. Now let's consider this thing. So here we have a bunch of numbers. So if I write the variance of all these numbers, I can write it as a sum of all these projections, x times di, so here is my data point, I should make it squared, and I should divide that by the number of data points. And that's pretty okay. Well, I should, I'm, I'm having, you know, not this way, yeah, let's subtract the mean value, of x times vi first, then squared. But now can you tell me what is the mean value of this thing? Remembering that I have performed centralization of matrix A. This so I zero. have big, yes, it's zero. So this one, this thing is essentially equal to zero. Because I have performed centralization. I have uh, subtracted the mean value of each feature from here. So when I will calculate mean value for these things, I will get the same means and they are already subtracted. So I have zero in here when I am calculating this mean value. So that's why I'm drawing all these 
vectors and all these axes having their origin in the center of mass of these points. That's not an arbitrary solution. So uh, this is because we have to form centralization. So that's why. And if I have this thing equal to zero, something interesting happens. So I have my variance equal to one over n, the sum of these scalar products squared. And now I have an interesting question for you. These things are basically coordinates of these vector. And this sort of construction you have already seen in the course of linear algebra. What is this? What is this thing? Square distance. So these are just coordinates of this vector. So all these constructions. And you have a vector and you are basically uh, taking all its coordinates squared and you are adding them. Like distance, so but, but no, also square of, of the vector, yeah. So it's square of its uh, length, or if I will let's say uh, designate to this vector, well, I have already designated x transposed a, so this is x transposed a. Well, let's let's first write that this way. Let's first write that norm squared, or I can write this norm squared as a vector transposed by vector. Well, this is vector rho, so probably vector rho by vector column. So that's what I have. Transposed. So that's what I have at the end of the day. And these can be written as what? X transpose A. And here I am swapping them places and putting transpose. Yeah, so A transpose X. So here is the value of my variance. So that's what I have. I guess transpose now, must be on the second term. No, on the first term, not the second. Which, which when, one transpose? Like when we have the norm squared, that's the inner product of this scene with itself. And yes. uh, then we need to have this in transposed times this scene itself. So uh, that we have but... a vector row multiplied by vector column to receive a number. Uh, yes, but the thing is that uh, this construction is a vector row. So that's what I was asking at the beginning. Uh, so I have X transposed by matrix, I have a row vector multiplied by a matrix, and that gives me a uh, row vector. If I had a matrix multiplied by column vector, I will get a column vector. If I have- I see. Yeah, so this is uh, basically a row vector, and this is a column vector. I see, okay. Uh, so that that's what we have. <clears throat> and yes, so this is uh, the uh, some sort of number. Okay, so uh, we have made some sort of progress. Uh, so now we know if I have chosen a direction x, I can write this sort of expression and I can basically pose the problem. I want to say, I want to maximize, I want to get a direct, such a direction X that this sort of expression, X transposed A, A transposed X is maximized. So I want to get this sort of X. But my vector x was des describing a direction. So I was supposing that the norm of x is equal to 1. So I need to restrict myself 
to searching such a vector x, the disnorm is equal to 1. And this is basically my minimization problem that I have. So what I had told you previously, that all machine learning algorithms, whatever we do, it always boils down to some sort of minimization or maximization of something. And here is the maximization problem that we have for the PCA. So our PCA has basically reduced to this sort of problem. And we more or less, we know how to solve them. So at least in this form, you can already put that into computer and you can ask him, please find something for me, find me this sort of X. And it will find such an X for you. We can do a few steps more just to have some sort of feeling of what are we solving. Probably you remember when you when we have this sort of problem, what do we do next? If we want to do some analytical steps, at least one or few more. So what we were writing when we have a constrained optimization problem. Lagrangian. Yes. So we were trying to write a Lagrangian. So what will our Lagrangian look like in this case? So there is something I want to maximize or minimize. So that will be my X transposed A, A transposed X. So, so here it is. But I have some sort of constraints. I need to incorporate these constraints into my Lagrangian. Of course, I want to do that. First of all, of course, I should transform them into some sort of standard form. And then I need to incorporate them in there in some more or, way or less convenient way. This thing will be more convenient to write uh, this way. So this norm equals one means that this norm squared equals one, which means that x transposed x equals one, which means if I want to put them into some sort of standard form, that x transpose x minus 1 equals 0. So now I can get this thing and put it into my Lagrangian with, of course, some Lagrangian multiplier. So here it is. And here's my Lagrangian. Now I will try to find some sort of minimum or maximum of this Lagrangian. And I can do that in some sort of calculus st way style. What should I do? I should find some sort of derivative with respect to x and, and make it equal to zero and then solve whatever I have in there. I'm not sure if you know how do we do that. Are you familiar with constructions like this? So when I have a function, let's suppose for simplicity a scalar function, and I'm trying to get a derivative with, with uh, respect to vector. Uh, have you seen these uh, constructions? Do you know wh what this expression means? Yeah, in some sense. So we, we will get at the end of the day a vector, yes, that has its components and each of its components is uh, the derivative with respect to appropriate component of X. So I, I want to get at the end of the day some sort of vector column uh, that will contain dL over dX1, 
dl over dx2 and so on and so forth. So depending how much these components do I have. So here it is. And probably I'm not sure if you have studied that or not, we can find derivatives of these things. So this one, and it's equal, I guess, to, let me think for a moment, that should be a, a transposed x plus, plus, I guess, this thing should be transposed and this thing as well. Or not. No, if, if it's square matrix, I guess it should be something like A, A transposed, transposed, X. And this part will give me two lambda X. I guess something like this. And you might notice that this thing is equal to a, a transposed. So I can collect everything together. I can equate that to zero. And at the end of the day, what I have is something like a, a transposed x plus, I guess, lambda x is equal zero. And this should be a very familiar problem for you that you probably know what it is. What is this problem? Any other questions? Please recall from linear algebra that we have maybe it will look a bit better for you if I write it this way. So for example, I will change lambda to some sort of, I don't know, lambda prime with the minus sign. And I will write uh, this A, A transposed as some sort of collected matrix. So let's say S times X, this is matrix, this is vector equals to lambda X. Do you recognize it in this form? Oh. Yeah. Yes. So it's eigenvectors and Eigen. eigenvalues. So at the end of the day, everything boils down to searching for eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this sort of construction, A, A transpose. And we have seen very similar thing previously in linear regression because we have constructed there a matrix, something transposed something. When we had a lot of features, we had a lot of, um, I don't know, uh, data points, everything was collected into one matrix, and we have multiplied them to get a new matrix. And we were already discussing that this, this is a good matrix. It's This is a square matrix, so it's square matrix. Now uh, we can do some things with, with it. And the interesting part is that here we have basically the same construction. And I will tell you even a bit more, if for linear regression, uh, we were concerned with distances of some sort of line between, uh, and these points uh, when we were drawing uh, this sort of distances along, uh, along y-axis. So when I was doing some regression, uh, and this is, for example, I, I would try this line as a regression line. I would measure distance to that this way. I will measure that along y-axis. Here I am measuring along some sort of perpendicular. So if you have ever thought, can I do some sort of linear regression if I'm measuring distances along this perpendicular, not along y-axis? This is the case. PCA is basically such an instrument. It does almost the same thing we had with linear regression, but instead of measuring along y-axis, 
we are measuring along perpendicular. And you can even get some intuition why is it so. Can you think why? In case of linear regression, were these two axes in some sense of symmetric? Were they meaning the same thing or not? No, they weren't. So one of them was a feature, the other one was the class that we were trying to predict. And we were basically measuring how much do we differ, how much our prediction differs with the class we are predicting. In this case, in this case, our axes are in some sense symmetric. They both are features. So in that case, it was meaningful to measure along the axis of the class. We were calculating the difference with respect to the class. Here, it is meaningful to calculate this perpendicular distance because these coordinates are in some sense equal. This is feature, this is another feature, just features. And it basically has some meaning to calculate the distance along the smallest the smallest distance we can get from here to this line. So it has some sense in it. So here is some sort of example for you. So it's like linear regression-like approach to the PCA. So you can think about PCA like some sort of linear regression, but with distances calculated along that perpendiculars, but not along that line of class because you don't have any class anymore. Okay. <clears throat> How much time do we have? Oh, very well. I think I can... I will get through these formulae quite quickly and then we will proceed everything else after the break. Okay. Uh, so basically here is the Lagrangian we have. We have calculated the derivatives equated to zero. We have an equation for eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Uh, that's everything. Okay, how do we solve that? Uh, of course, we can solve that with some sort of uh, numerical methods or we can think of some analytical approaches that um, that depends. Uh, what I want to show you, if we have the matrix S, I want you to recall from uh, the previous lectures that if I have calculated it as some matrix uh, times matrix transpose, uh, the same matrix transpose, I mean, you get not only square matrix, you get you get a symmetric matrix, so that's really good, and uh, these matrix you can let's say transform that into uh, some sort of product in sort of product and this product contains a uh, unitary matrix u some diagonal matrix lambda and this matrix u transposed so u is some sort of orth orthogonal matrix lambda is diagonal and contains numbers lambda 1 to uh, lambda n and we recall that u transpose is equal to u minus 1. So it's inverse. You can get its inverse by just transposing this matrix. If that's so, I can calculate the variation of data in a very interesting way. Uh, so I can write it as this sort of sum of all these lambda i's. Here it is. Well, it's sort of uh, more or less simple calculation, so I'm not getting into all of that. Uh, but anyway, I want you just to see this sort of expression. Now, what can I do with these matrices and what can I perform with that? Uh, these lambda i's are basically eigenvalues uh, that I have for uh, my matrix S. And these eigenvalues, they correspond to variances I have along axes. 
So my cumulative variance, so the overall what I have, is the sum of uh, lambda i's. If I remove uh, some of the uh, lambda i's, I set them, for example, equal to zero, or I will try to, to remove some of the columns of the uh, matrix U that corresponds to some sort of small lambdas. We can suppose that we have sorted them from the biggest lambda to the smallest lambda, so I will always suppose that lambda 1 has uh, the biggest value and corresponds to the biggest variance we, we can have, and lambda 5 in this case corresponds to the smallest value. So I can eliminate some of them, and that will uh, lead me to removing some of the uh, dimensions. What we have now, so we can get some new, and we can get some new data by updating our old features. So I can eliminate uh, some of the lambdas and I can collect everything back together and I will get some new data set with some features eliminated. Of course, I can use uh, matrix U to get to a new coordinate system and do something in there. So that depends on what I want. In the end, we expect that modified data matrix with reduced number of rows, uh, features, and the new features are linear combinations of the old ones. So we are just transforming some old features into some linear combinations of new features as you might expect from changing coordinate system. And we expect these new features to be weakly correlated and, of course, ordered according to their importance. Now what I want you to show is just some simple physical example, I guess. And then, well, maybe then I will tell you something about these decompositions. Okay, so we'll leave it for, for later. What I want you to show is some sort of example uh, how PCA can help us to gain some insights into the uh, data we have. So here is an example for you. Uh, suppose I have a black box uh, containing some physical system. Uh, here is the physical system that resides uh, inside that box. These are two penduli, I guess, and they are weakly coupled uh, with some sort of spring with coefficient k. So their length is L, uh, they have some masses, some m, and they are coupled with this sort of spring. And we can write their equation of motions uh, for this uh, coupled penduli. So uh, these are basically just uh, Newton's equations, so I have some sort of uh, force which is, which is equal to mass over acceleration, and here I have this force expressed uh, in terms like terms that comes from uh, gravitational interaction, so I have some gravity that pulls my uh, masses down, and I have this spring that pulls it somewhere sideways, and so on. And so these are my two equations. If I do this system, if I know what's inside of that black box, I can try to do something with these equations. So what will I do is basically write some sort, some sort of uh, Hamiltonian. I will write kinetic energy. I will write potential energy. Uh, I will see that potential energy can be expressed in this way. Then I will think it's not very nice. So probably I can transform and change my coordinates from x1 and x2, which are these sort of deltas. So how do they differ uh, from uh, these vertical positions? And I can get to some different coordinates, q1 and q2, in which case I will have, let's say, more nicely looking my matrix u. It will be diagonal. So my matrix U will become a diagonal matrix in this case. And thus, my equations will be decoupled. So in uh, this case, I can just solve them because they both contain, contain x1 and x2. But I can decouple them and uh, this equation will contain q1 only. The other one will contain q2 only. 
And if you look a little bit further, we will understand that basically our Q1 and Q2 correspond to two sorts of modes. So we are transferring from some sort of physical positions to some sort of modes, which one of them looks like this. So I have pendulum one and pendulum two swinging in uh, concordance to one to another. So they basically keep uh, the distance constant between them. And here is the second mode when they have a very different phase. So they are like doing something like this. So that's what I have. But if it's just if I'm doing this thing analytically. So here is my uh, new potential energy matrix. It's diagonal. It look very looks very nicely and so on. That's OK. But that's analytics. So I can do that. So for example, I can write this system I, of equations. I can do something here and there and so on. Now suppose uh, we are considering this problem as a data scientist. We don't know what is inside these blocks. Whatever we can get out of there is just some sort of measurements that, that give us some idea that inside the box some physical process is happening. So I am measuring basically positions of these masses but I don't know that these are masses. I don't know anything about that springs and gravity and so on. I just know their positions. And here is the plot of positions of uh, mass one and mass two with respect to time t. So I have measured something. I'm looking at this plot and I'm thinking, well, some periodical process is basically happening in there, but I don't know what it is. So here are how it looks like. Now suppose I will take all these data, everything I have in here, and I will put that into the PCA. So here is my PCA, and I want to transform these features. Moreover, I'm not even throwing away any features. I have two features, and I am transforming them into two features. And I'm performing this fit and transform. And I am plotting the transformed version of what I have. And here is the plot. I will try to fit them both into one uh, screen. And here you can see plot number one and plot number two. And you see that they are quite different. The second one it's, is much simpler than the first one. So here, here what we have. And if we consider uh, this plot carefully, we will find out that basically PCA has entangled for us these, uh, these two modes. So whatever I have performed in an analytical way by transforming all that matrices, so on and so forth, that was quite natural, for example, if you are treating this problem analytically, was performed by the PCA without knowing anything about the inner structure of the box and all that physical laws that are in working inside of that box. So it just knows some bare data. So just measurements uh, of some, some numbers. It doesn't even understand these are some positions, just numbers for the PCA. But it was able to extract some useful data for us. Probably uh, with this example, what I want to show you that reducing the number of dimensions you can even get some insights into the problem you are considering even without knowing what's happening in there. So probably that might help you to guess something about the data and to understand something more about the data that you have in your uh, data set. Okay. So the second example was quite similar. I was just not using any pendulum. I was using some uh, spring and mass system uh, with like five masses or something like that. Not going into the details, but when I put it uh, through the PCA, you can see that it has somehow filtered at least one interesting mode out of there. So probably it can help us gaining some information uh, in this case as well despite the system is quite complicated. So five masses in a spring mass system, it's quite a messy system of linear equations. 
uh, differential equations. So probably that's a really nice thing. Okay. Probably, I guess probably with that being uh, said, we can make a small break and then I will return to all these PCA things and show you what I have more. So a break. We have finished at the point where we have some sort of, let's say, analytical expression for the PCA that we should minimize and get some sort of result, get our PCA. And we have considered at least one example when PCA can give us some insights into the uh, data that we have. So we have considered some physical system and we saw that basically such a workflow that a physicist performs like dial analyzing some matrix and so on and so forth and getting all, all that modes we can get something very similar just by putting data into the uh, PCA. So in some sense, if we don't know anything about the origin of the data, where did we acquire that data, we can use PCA and gain some insights. Now this part, I wanna show you some more examples of the usage of the PCA and get a little bit more into the uh, details of how do we uh, decompose uh, the matrices and just tell some general analytical things so that maybe uh, will be useful for you in the future. So let's get into that. Uh, first of all, here is a demo for you that performs PCA. Uh, we use sklearn decomposition it contains PCA. I will be performing PCA with two components. I will be getting two components and returning two components. So I'm just transferring to a different coordinate system, but not making the number of features smaller or something like that, at least for this demo. What I want you to show that if we have a data set, something like this, now I am performing PCA. Here you see new axis that I have acquired when I have performed the PCA. And the length of these vectors, of course, axes go along these vectors and their length basically signifies the variance along corresponding axis. So if you see that this vector is very long, you know that the variance along these axes is very large compared to the variance along these uh, other axes. What I want you to appreciate at this point, I want you to think about what will happen if I will create some outlier. So I, will, I am taking one of my points and I'm dragging it somewhere in here. So I have created an outlier. To think about it, you can recall the function that we are minimizing, or you can think about linear regression. So we had something very similar in linear regression. We had very similar formulae in linear regression. So maybe by some sort of analogy, uh, you can guess what will happen to PCA when I am creating this sort of outlier. So when I press this button, do PCA, what will I get? Will my coordinates change drastically or they will remain approximately the same? Maybe not so drastically, but mm -hmm. they will, will change big, bigger, will be smaller and that smaller will be bigger and they will be more equal. Okay, now I'm doing the PCA and here we have it. I guess they have changed drastically. Yeah. So they are basically giving us very different directions and their length is very different as well. Now, can you tell me why that happened? Because we have um, bigger variance on each axis. 
recall what are we yeah. minimizing. So recall the function that we are minimizing. Where did I have it? Uh, Lagrangian. Well, the, this one, this one, this line. So let's recall this line. So we are minimizing with respect to vector x. So what is this function? It's a quadratic function, yeah? Yeah. So, so we have x multiplied by something and then by x. So it's basically some sort of quadratic function. Of course, you have all the all sorts of mass uh, in here. So like xi times xj, so on and so forth. So many, many components. But in its essence, it's a quadratic function. And how does the quadratic function behave? We had a very similar problem in a linear regression. We had a quadratic function there as well. It grows, it grows rapidly. So some small changes in data, we are just making a tiny nudge and we get a very large difference uh, in our loss function. So that means when I'm dragging some point somewhere out there, so I'm creating some outlier, this point will be making, I don't know, some very drastical influence and adding a very, very large number to the overall loss function. So that's what it does. So here is again the situation when outliers are bad. So if I'm removing this outlier, everything gets back to normal. So please remember this situation. So we had a very similar thing with linear regression, dragging some points out there, it was causing our loss function to grow rapidly and we had a problem because basically the mechanism that is trying to minimize the function, it puts all its effort into driving that point somewhere, somewhere closer. So into minimizing the loss caused by that outlier. And it basically starts neglecting the rest points. So probably we don't want it to neglect the rest of the points and we should do something with outliers. So be careful with, with that. For the linear regression, if you remember, we had at least few methods uh, to do something with uh, this sort of situation. Starting with some simple things like trying to remove outliers before we get to linear regression. Of course, you can try to do the same thing right here. And for uh, the linear regression, there are uh, some methods like RENZAC, if anyone remembers. So probably I have told that to you, no? That's when we were trying to randomly sample our uh, points. And we were hoping that we have much, uh, that the number of outliers is much lower than the number of uh, the points that are okay. So when sampling that points, we had a bigger chance to get all points uh, that are okay for us and perform linear regression on that points. So uh, that was the case. And there are some works when uh, people try to modify the loss function for the linear regression. So probably something similar can be done for PCA, but it's not the thing I'm familiar with. So probably uh, something can be done this way as well. At least random sampling can be done certainly, so you can do that. Okay, a few more words about math. We have we have seen and uh, we have seen. So I have shown to you uh, that uh, the problem basically boils down to the problem of searching eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We recall that here is our equation that governs basically uh, the property of being an eigenvector so that uh, when matrix A acts on some vector it just changes its length but it doesn't rotate it somehow or do something like that. Here is an example of x being an eigenvector it just gets a bit longer 
And here is the y that is not an eigenvector. It, it is rotated as well as it, its length is changed. The set of all uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors is called an eigensystem. So uh, for each eigenvector, you have some sort of eigenvalue that corresponds to that eigenvector. Eigenvectors are not always orthogonal, but you can prove that for symmetric matrices, they are. And it's a really nice property because if you are having some sort of symmetric matrix, and we have a symmetric matrix. Why do we have it? Because we have constructed it as A, A transposed. So multiplying A, A transposed, we get a symmetric matrix, and symmetric matrix will have eigenvectors that are orthogonal. So they are basically defining for us some sort of orthogonal system. Okay, one more notion about orthogonal matrices. These are matrices uh, with the property that u transpose equals to u minus 1. Uh, that's good. And that means the analog of uh, these the, of symmetric matrices, matrices in complex space are so-called unitary matrices. Uh, that's OK. And orthogonal matrices, they can perform rotations, reflections. And they basically store orthonormal vectors. So here is the structure of matrix U that, can create, that contains three vector columns. And here is a more like nice picture for you. Here is the matrix U, and it stores as its vector columns three orthonormal vectors uh, that define for us some sort of coordinate system. Here are a few pr properties. We don't care about that. What we care about that we can decompose some matrices into product of different matrices that are more convenient for us for performing some tasks. There are many kinds of decompositions. I have written in here just a few of them, like LU, Haleski, QR, Polar, so on and so forth. But we will be interested in so-called eigen decomposition or spectral decomposition and singular value decomposition. So these are two decompositions uh, that we are interested in. So eigen decomposition, it's uh, basically what it does. So you have a matrix A that is n by n symmetric matrix, and it's possible to switch to the orthonormal ba basis that consists of eigenvectors of A. In this basis, matrix A uh, becomes uh, diagonal. And here is an example how it looks like. So I have a matrix A. Here I have a matrix U that switches my coordinate system to another coordinate system. In that new coordinate system, my matrix A looks like matrix lambda uh, that is diagonal and on its diagonal leave all the eigenvalues. And then I return back to my original system with matrix U. So here is my uh, decomposition. Here is the format of these, these matrices. Now what I want you to show, why do we need all these compositions? Well, it's we, we will get uh, in a moment why do we need them for PCA. Uh, but I just want you to notice that if we have some sort of matrix power to to calculate, I want to calculate, for example, a to the power of n. If I have decomposed my matrix into this sort of form, like u lambda u transposed, I can very easily calculate its nth power. It's I need just to take to the power of n each of uh, the eigenvalues lambda that reside on the diagonal of the matrix lambda. So that's everything. So matrices U, they, they remain as, as they are. And if you are defining some functions on matrices and you are defining them in uh, terms of, I don't know, something like Taylor series or some polynomials and so on, you will basically have this function to act only on the diagonal matrix and unitary matrices will remain on the, uh, on the sides. 
So here, uh, it's a really nice property to have uh, because in many cases, you will want to calculate some sort of a to the power of n and uh, this decomposition will really help you. It really makes our calculations much, much quicker. You can calculate the determinant of the matrix A and you will get uh, the product of all its eigenvalues. That's more or less obvious because uh, you have unitary matrices. Uh, they have a determinant equal to uh, one or maybe to minus one. Anyway, there are two of them. So it's just removed and whatever you have, the determinant of A is equal to determinant of lambda and lambda has the small lambda i on its diagonals. And of course, uh, the trace is calculated the same way. Or uh, we can have one more decomposition that is more often used in all that SK learns and so on, uh, so-called SVD decomposition, singular value uh, decomposition. In this case, you can use not only square, but uh, some sort of rectangular matrix A, and we decompose it into a very similar fashion when we have orthonormal matrix U and orthonormal v matrix V that are multiplied by a diagonal matrix uh, sigma. Uh, the diagonal entries of sigma, sigma i's, are known as singular values of A. So it's some sort of analogy of uh, the eigenvalues. Uh, and here is uh, some sort of example for you how that looks like and, and what form do they have. So here is my matrix A, it, it is M times N, it has M times N entries. And I can decompose that into an orthonormal matrix U. It's a square matrix M by M into a matrix V that is square matrix N by N and into sigma matrix that is rectangular. It's not square matrix but it's diagonal, so it has some values on its diagonal. And we will call these values singular values. And what's interesting in here, I want you to first notice that these matrices U and V, that they are square matrices, that we can do all the neat things with them, so we can multiply them. We know that U, U transpose and V, V transpose is unitary matrix. Uh, so. That's very nice. Sigma matrix is rectangular, uh, but it, have, it has a, quite a simple structure. What else? The uh, geometrical meaning of all these, so here I'm showing to you in a geometrical meaning, uh, I have a, a coordinate system. My matrix V somehow rotates that system. My matrix sigma distorts it, along uh, these new coordinates, so it distorts with uh, coefficients sigma 1 and sigma 2, and then matrix U transforms it, maybe not back, but into some new system. In here, when sigma x, we change the number of coordinates, so sigma can change the number of coordinates. It can remove some of them, it can add some of them equal to zero, so that depends. And here is, and that's basically the action of the matrix A. Now what we have in here. So this helps us to calculate some interesting things. Uh, for example, uh, you can calculate a pseudo inverse matrix. And if you have an SVD decomposition of a matrix, uh, you calculate pseudo inverse very quickly with uh, this sort of formula. So almost nothing changes. So I had a matrix A that was equal to U sigma V transposed. And I'm transferring to V sigma plus U transposed. And sigma plus is basically the same sigma. I have just transposed that. And I have substituted for each of the uh, non-zero sigmas, of the, uh, the singular values. I have substituted one over that sigma. So that's what I'm doing. So if you recall, we had some formulae, for example, for linear regression. And in that formula, pseudo inverse of Penrose was appearing. And we can think, well, it's not so easy to calculate that pseudo inverse. But if you have numerical methods that allow you to calculate 
SVD decomposition. And as far as I know, sklearn, it's the way preferred by sklearn. So they perform SVD decomposition, and there is even some sort of property in that functions that you can set which method you use to perform that SVD decomposition. Uh, you can really quickly transfer to the uh, pseudo inverse matrix in this way. So that's a really nice property to have. Hopefully you see how it's all, how that all works uh, when I am multiplying all these matrices. So if I will multiply A plus by A, I will have U transposed U to be removed. They are just equal to the unitary matrix. And I will multiply these sigmas and they will give me uh, basically unitary matrix as well. Okay, and one more thing to, to notice that we need for our PCA is the idea of rank. So the rank is the number of non-zero singular values. And there is an interesting thing. Uh, there is theorem uh, by Eckert and Young. Uh, of course, I will not prove that. But it says to you that if you want to approximate your matrix, so here is an interesting like problem. So you are having a matrix. And you want to approximate that matrix, find some closed matrix to this one, with the property of having some predefined rank. So you want some lower rank approximation. So your matrix has rank 10 and you want rank 2. And this is equivalent to setting the lowest singular values to zero. So you are eliminating some singular values by setting them equal to zero. And you are basically collecting everything back together. So I have decomposed my matrix, performed SVD. I'm looking at sigma matrix. I'm removing some of the sigmas. And then I'm collecting everything back together. And I'm getting an approximation of my original matrix that has some predefined rank. Of course, you can ask me, how do we think even about two, matrix, two matrices being close, what it means to, for them to be close. And it so happens that Eckert and Young theorem works at least in case of two let's say, norms or measures of the distance between matrices. Uh, it's when you are calculating so-called Frobenius norm. That's uh, the sum of squares of all entries of the matrix. So it's like you are making your matrix into one long, long vector, and you are calculating like distance between these vectors. So you are disregarding that two-dimensional structure. You are just making it into one row. Or it, it still works if you use so-called spectral norm. So do you know what is a spectral norm? No? So if you are having some sort of matrix, you have some sort of operator, uh, you can act with that on different vectors. And suppose I, I take some small ball with the uh, vectors of length one, and I will act with that operator on all that vectors. So they will be somehow moved around, somehow distorted, and I can find among this vector the one that became the biggest one. And the length of that vector that became the biggest one, I will consider that as the spectral norm. So that the maximum length of the vector I can achieve if I act with this matrix on the uh, vector of length one. So that's uh, the spectral norm. Uh, so with respect, so either you are measuring distance between matrices with respect to the spectral norm. Hopefully you remember. So if I have a norm, I can induce a ma a metric on a space. So I have a norm. It gives me it gives me some sort of numbers for each element of uh, the space. If this is a linear space, I can sub I can subtract elements. So I can always calculate norm of some sort of x minus y, uh, when x and y are elements of that uh, linear space, and that basically gives me a, matri a metric on that space. So norm always induces metric. Not each metric can be induced by a norm, so you can have some metric that 
does not correspond to any norm, but if you have a norm, you can always get a matrix. So at least in that way, it always works. Okay, and with this Eckert-Young theorem, you can use that in practice if you need to lower down the rank of your matrices. And that may be more or less uh, useful for you. I have even tried to use that once in practice by transforming uh, all matrices to rank one, and matrices of rank one can be well presented as the tensor product of two vectors, vector column and vector row. And you can rewrite some, you can basically rewrite some operations with that matrices uh, more simple with that vectors and gain something from that. Okay, so here is an SVD performed analytically. Here is my matrix A. If I'm calculating A transpose A, and I have an SVD decomposition, uh, you can see what happens. So here is what I'm getting from there. So uh, V and sigma transpose, sigma V transpose. So the problem of finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors for A, A transpose can be basically sought in the terms of performing SVD decomposition of matrix A. So I don't need to multiply even that matrices if I have some engines that performs for me this sort of decomposition. So here is what I have. Here is some sort of example. I don't think I want to get through all of that. Here is my matrix A. This is what happens when I'm calculating all that things so on and so forth. So, okay, what do we have at the end of the day? So we know now, more or less, how to perform PCA with all that machinery. So we have written our Lagrangian. So we remember, so where did we start? So we had all our points. We have collected them into one big matrix. We perform centralization. We perform some sort of centralization that we, we moved our points in a way that center of mass and, and origin of coordinates are coinciding. We have normalized them. We performed some sort of normalization because we don't want some of the features to be in a range from 0 to 1 and some different features from 0 to 100. That will make uh, just um, some features not working because uh, you know that this uh, loss function, it will react much more uh, to the bigger values. So we are always trying to normalize somehow. And so we perform that normalization. Then I showed to you that even perform that normalization, when we have equal variance along different axes, it still doesn't mean that PCA is useless. Why? Because we can somehow rotate our axis and we can get into the situation when we have all the variance along one axis and almost nothing along some different axis. Then we have written with you this sort of problem. So when I'm projecting on some direction, so on and so forth, wrote that Lagrangian. And we know that to minimize that Lagrangian, we can either use some of the methods from our, let's say, sklearn optimize or something, or we can perform SVD decomposition uh, of the matrix A, and then we will quickly get the result we want. So one of these two ways. Now let's get to a little bit more practical things and consider what we can do with PCA uh, in, um, in the practice and how do we do that. So here is a data set that I have, so some sort of points. Here I am performing some decomposition and I'm performing PCA fig. Uh, I want you to notice this parameter called SVD solver. So everything I told you about SVD, it's not like in vain. Uh, it's for you to understand a bit more what's there under the hood uh, in the sklearn decomposition PCA. So they are performing SVD decomposition. So to get more to numerical methods, how to do that, you will probably need to consider some different, some articles. But anyway, this is the way to go if you want to reproduce somehow what does SQLearn decomposition do. 
And here I'm having PCA components. So I'm getting vectors out of there. So some new coordinate system. So here how I get it. And here is explained variance. So here is the variance along each of these axes. And this is a very nice thing to have because looking at this variance, I can think how good is my feature. So how strongly do I need that? Maybe I can remove that. Maybe I don't need it. So on and so forth. Uh, and here is an example when I have just put these uh, sort of vectors showing me the directions of PCA and, uh, well, values of the variance at their length. Here is one more example. So PCA is a dimensionality reduction. I have performed PCA. And here I am trying to perform inverse, inverse PCA to show my new points with the reduced coordinate. So when I'm performing PCA and I'm saying I have a data set and each data point has two coordinates. Now I want to do PCA and I want to get one component, so just one coordinate. That will return me my features in a transformed, as you see here, transformed shape. So I will have, if I had 200 features with two coordinates, now I have 200 features with one coordinate. If I will try to draw that, I will get just some points along some, I don't know, some line of real numbers. That's good. But what if I want to overlay them with the old points? And here is a really nice thing to notice. Uh, if you are performing PCA, you are performing some linear transformation. What is good about these transformations that you can try to perform the inverse transformation? When we do some sort of manifold learning and so on and so forth, uh, we can't do that. So we don't always have inverse transformation, but in this case we do because it's linear. So I'm doing inverse transform of what I have transformed to one coordinate. Now I'm returning to two coordinates and I'm transforming it back and I'm getting these points. So I have projected them on the new direction. So this is what I have. And in this case, I can think about it like removing some sort of noise from these points. I will show you an example a little bit later you can think about this like some sort of removal of a noise. Okay, now a bit more practical example with visualization. Probably you all know how data set MNIST looks like. So uh, you have seen that probably, yeah? So handwritten digits, small images, eight by eight, I guess. And each of the pixels, it's some sort of shade of gray, let's say. How many coordinates, how many dimensions do we have for the uh, MNIST data set? Yes. So each, pic each picture is basically my data point and it lives in, the, uh, in a space with 64 dimensions. Uh, of course, I cannot draw that. So I just can't do that. So let me do PCA and squeeze everything into two dimensions only. And here is how it looks like. It may look a bit, let's say, strange for you, uh, but if you look carefully, you will see that different digits, they tend to clusterize. So I'm getting from 64 dimensions to two dimensions. I am visualizing this data set and I am still seeing some properties of the data set. For example, I'm seeing that they are trying to clusterize. So you might probably think if I have some sort of method to clusterize points or I'm trying to classify them somehow, I'm training some classifier and so on, maybe it will work much better in two dimensions than in 64 dimensions. That's a much smaller problem it's much easier to minimize some functions in there. 
and you still see some patterns in here. So it's they are not just some randomly scattered. There are some patterns in here, and you see that these points are like sticking together. So you have number three that they have a cluster here, and number zero uh, or digit zero it has a cluster here, and so on and so forth. And here is an example of the same thing, but in 3D. So I'm adding one more dimension. I'm still able to visualize that more or less. And now you can see that all different digits, they are still trying to stick together. So probably performing some classification algorithm in this space uh, will be more or less easy for me because I'm clearly seeing uh, how these how this data points, how do they behave. And it should be much easier uh, than to do uh, the same thing into 64 dimensions. Okay, so for uh, visualization, you probably know that I should use two or three dimensions. So it would be problematic to use more of that because I probably cannot draw that. But what do we do if we are using PCA as the component of some of complicated pipeline as the first step in that pipeline? Uh, of course, we can think about the problem of choosing the number of components that we need uh, for our methods to, to work well. And here is one of the examples how you can choose uh, that number. So how good is it? So here I am performing PCA. And here I am trying to get so-called explained variance ratio. And I'm drawing the uh, cumulative sum of the explained variance ratio. So how much I have accumulated that explained variance. And you see this plot. Uh, so you will always get uh, these sort of plots uh, that grow from 0 to 1. And they will show you, if, you t if I take, for example, 20 components in here, how much variance in my original data I will explain. In this case, it's something like 90%. If I want to explain some more or less, I can choose some different numbers along this line. So I can draw this line and I can say for myself, so for example, I want to conserve, I want to retain at least 90% of the variance, or I want to retain 95% of the variance or something like that. So I can set a threshold, how much variance do I want to retain in my transformed data and why am I so, so much thinking about the variance? Who can recall that? Why is that so crucial for me to retain that variance in data? Recall the beginning of the lecture. I was showing you two features. Uh, so I'm working in a uh, suggestion that variance means basically uh, useful information. So we were considering two features, and I have shown you if a feature is almost constant, it does not contain any useful information. And I can't use that for anything. It's just some sort of number that is the same for all data points. What can I do with that? How can I classify with the data? What, it's just useless. So I want to retain my variance because I'm considering variance as some sort of information. So the more diverse my features are, the more information they probably contain inside. So here I'm calculating these sort of percents of the variance that I can retain by taking 10, 20, 30, and so on number of components. And I can set for myself some threshold that I don't want to lose more than 5% of that information, or I don't want to lose more than 10%, and so on and so forth. So here is why I'm so concerned with all that variances. So with this plot, I can find some point 
that will look nice to me so i will tell okay i will take 20 components that retains 90 percent so that's great for me so doing pca with 20 components now pca as a noise filtering so i want to reduce noise in my data set here's one again an example for you the same MNIST data set so i have some handwritten digits 64 dimensional space. Now I add some noise. So here you see the same digits, but they are quite noisy. And if on this first image, uh, they are more or less uh, recognizable, well, more or less, uh, then with the noise, well, they basically become almost incredible. So it's really hard somewhere to understand what do we mean by, th by these digits? Now what I want to do, I'm taking this noisy data and I am performing PCA, uh, retaining, let's say, 50% of variation. So what I'm doing, I will transform that sort of coordinate system into the new one, and I will remove half of the axis, then half uh, smallest variance. And I will consider that probably in that axis, some noise was contained, so no useful information. So that useful information, I suppose, it gives a large variance. And when I remove all that, here is the result I have. So you can clearly see that I have cleaned my data set from some noise that was in it. So now it looks let's say, much better than it was before. And you can compare that with the original data set. So that's what we have. So you can use PCA to reduce noise just by removing some noisy features. Of course, everything is based on some sort of assumptions that we do, and the biggest assumption is uh, the assumption of the variance, so that we consider that Variance means information, and large variance means some useful information, while some small variance mostly means some noise or something like that. And here is probably the last example that we have. Uh, we have a data set eigenfaces. I'm taking this uh, data set, and I'm trying to perform a PCA on that data set. Uh, once again, you see this parameter, SVD solver. I'm using randomized solver because I have a big data set and it's, it will work too long if I use something else. And I'm having this faces data. I fit that with the uh, PCA. And now I'm trying to show uh, some sort of components of the PCA. And I'm drawing that components. So here how they look like. So I'm getting like new vectors. And these new vectors, they can be visualized and they look like this. So uh, these are uh, my new, new vectors along which I will perform some sort um, of projection and so on and so forth. Here I'm trying to draw the explained variance. Here is my explained variance. And I can see uh, how many number of components do I need to have, for example, a 90% of retained variance or something like that. Now, what do I do? I'm taking all the things. I am performing uh, well, I'm performing reconstruction with 150 features retained. Why do I do that? I will, in the, in the future, for example, I will want to perform, I don't know, some sort of classification on this data set or something like that. And to perform that classification, I will employ some different algorithms. I don't want to overload that algorithm uh, with the number of dimensions because you know the curse of dimensionality. So I want to make it work somehow better. For this to, to be true, I want 
to reduce the number of features that I have. And I reduce them to 150 features. And to make some sense of uh, what happened to my data, I'm transforming that 150 components back by setting all the missing components to zero. And I'm trying to visualize that as, as picture because my original data points that they had meaning as pictures and I'm trying to visualize them here as well. And if you look closely, you will see that more or less 150 numbers were pretty okay to retain well, most features of the faces that you see here. So yes, they look a little bit blurry, but uh, it's a very big difference whether we have uh, the, the face, some big picture of the face, or we have only 150 components. So that's, that's a difference. I don't know if I can find here some shape. Here is the shape. So. Uh, my images were 62 by 47. I can multiply such big numbers in my head, but for example, if I even take 50 by 50, that will be uh, 2,500 features. So two and a half K of features I had. And I have reduced that to only 150 features. So probably you might guess that many algorithms will work much better on 150 features than on two and a five thousand features. So that's much better. Okay. With that being said, now let's get to some sort of summary. So today we have a considered principal component analysis. And it's, uh, well, it's interesting method that allows us to perform reduction of the number of coordinates that we have. And we can use that for many things, like, for example, uh, visualizing of data, because we need only uh, to have only two or three coordinates to perform a visualization. And it's really good if we can extract three most meaningful coordinates from our data set we can gain some insights into our data performing PCA. I showed that to you in the example with that pendulum. We can make some subsequent algorithms to perform better because uh, we know about the curse of dimensionality and we are trying to reduce the number of dimensions to make our subsequent algorithms to perform better. And that's, that's really good. What else? We can make the correlation between features smaller. In many cases, we don't want our features to be strongly correlated. So that's a good thing as well. And we can perform even some sort of noise reduction. So we can remove some, we can transform everything we have and we can remove some features uh, with low variances, supposing that we are removing some noise out of them. Of course, PCA has some sort of weaknesses to it. Now, it's more its main weakness is that it tends to be highly affected by the outliers. So I have shown that to you. I'm taking just one point, transforming that into outlier, and we get some very bad result. That's because of the minimization function that contains all that squares. Uh, so for this reason, they are, uh, there are some sort of new versions of PCA uh, developed, some more rob robust versions, and they are trying, for example, iteratively discard some data points and so on and so forth. When doing PCA, uh, we are uh, making some sort of uh, assumptions. For example, uh, to perform PCA, it would be really nice to have at least 150 observation and uh, perfectly would be have five to one ratio of observation numbers to features. So you won't have five times more uh, your data points than you have features. At least is the way it was described in an article from uh, 2010. So people were trying to measure performance of the PCA. So Maybe as a rule of thumb, you will want to use some sort of uh, these uh, numbers. 
What else? Uh, we suppose that about correlation that the feature set is correlated, so the reduced feature set effectively represents the original data space. Linearity. All variables exhibit a constant multivariate normal, uh, normal relationship and principal components are a linear combination of the original features. So that's what we, we, what we were basically performing. So all that synchronization, normalization, then rotating coordinates, it's all based on this. We suppose that there are no significant outliers in the data when we are performing PCA from the STLearn. Otherwise, it will get just carried away. And of course, uh, the main, I guess, uh, from my point of view, assumption is that large variance implies more structure. So the more variance we have, the more useful information is incorporated into that feature. If it's not true, it's everything of this has no sense because there will be no meaning of extracting some new features with uh, large variances. So what else? Some limitations of the PCA. So. PCA can lead to a reduction in model performance on data sets uh, with no or low, low feature correlation, or does not, or that does not mean imply the assumptions of uh, linearity. If we don't have that, PCA will not help us. So we need to be sure that linear transformation will make something better. If you are performing linear transformation, you are getting basically the same you had at the beginning. Well. That won't help you. Okay, so outliers that it's I told you, and the one more interesting thing, the question of the interpretability. In many cases, you have your original features to be meaningful. So the, these are some measured values, and you can prescribe them some exact physical meaning. So here is some voltage, here is something else some temperature, some mass, so on and so forth. Uh, if you get them through the PCA, you will get some sort of linear combinations of all of that. And it's not always easy to say whether what you have uh, has some physical meaning, because you might get some linear combination of some voltage and mass and, I don't know, and length and so on. So this will be some crazy parameter that you can't, that cannot have any physical meaning, for example. So you can lose some sort of interpretability when you are transferring to your new space with the, the lower number of uh, dimensions. So that may be a little bit of a problem for you if you need to, to interpret your data. Okay, so when should you use the PCA method? method. So uh, you should consider, do you want to reduce uh, the number of variables, but you aren't able to identify variables to completely remove from the consideration. So probably you have a data set, you can look at it and you can say, well, this feature looks like redundant, or this feature is useless. You can remove them by hand, so nothing prevents you from that. You can just do that. But you can look at your features and Everywhere, some numbers are changing, and you can't say it just this way that this feature is more useful, that feature is not so useful, and so on. And you may think maybe I can transform them somehow that some feature will some features will become more you even more useful while some other will become more useless, and you will remove them completely. So probably that's uh, the way. The second uh, thing you might consider, do you want to ensure your variables are independent of one another? So PCA nicely entangles your variables and uh, you can make them like unentangled and you can uh, transform, change that correlation coefficient to zero or almost zero. And you can think about, are you comfortable uh, making your independent uh, variables less interpretable? you are transforming something with PCA, probably you are losing some sort of interpretability of your variables. And is that okay for you or it's not? So that depends on what problem are you solving. And maybe it's very crucial for you that you can interpret each uh, variable, each of your features as some sort of meaningful physical value. If you lose that, you may have some sort of problems. 
Okay, so I guess with that being said, we are complete. Maybe if you have some questions or comments, please feel free to ask. I guess no comments. It, I, I have a question. Ah, so oh, yes, uh, am I correct that uh, if you have a data set with different features some of them are continuous and have a lot of different values um, and the other features are categorical and we for example convert them to numbers then pca will discard these categorical features in case wow. if we if for example um like the continuous uh, values, they can be really high. For example, it's like some price, currency, and, and the numbers can be really high. And uh, and for the categorical variables, we convert them to numbers like one, two, three. And in that case, we have uh, one result of the PCA at the end, and, and it's probably will discard these categorical variables. But if we convert categorical variables to like, 100, uh, 200, 300, or something with higher variance, like 10, 200, 3000, uh, then it will retain. So, so my question is, how does it what behave do we do when we have categorical case? variables? Yeah. Well, I will basically advise, uh, first of all, to keep separate uh, categorical features from all that features like with type of ratio and so on. So if you remember the lecture on statistics, I told you that we really have very different like source of data and not every operation is meaningful on that type of data that you have. So if you have some sort of categorical features that may be some sort of nominal data and so on, and you cannot multiply that data on some on some numbers. Uh, you cannot uh, find some mean value and so on. So it's just meaningless. And if we get into PCA, what we do in PCA, we are basically performing some multiplications, some matrices, so on and so forth. So you will probably want that your measured data has the type for which these operations are meaningful so that you can find some mean value, that you can multiply it by numbers, so on and so forth. So that may be uh, the case. So probably you will uh, want to keep your categorical features separately and not put them into the PCA, just keep them as it is. And that's a really normal situation. Uh, if you consider some examples out there in the internet, uh, if you see how people are building that pipelines, uh, they are often separating features, some features to one pipeline, some to different pipeline, and then uh, and then everything converges back. So you can perform uh, PCA on some features while leave out some different features. Then you can do I don't know, train some tree on part of your features and some different part used to for something else. So it it will be probably okay. So my advice will be to keep them separate uh, just because all the operations we need for PCA, uh, they have no uh, meaning uh, for our features, uh, which are categorical or something like that. So with that discrete type of data. So we can do that. And the same problem we will have if we will put them into some different methods. For example, if you will try to perform linear regression on the categorical features, or if you will try to train an SVM. Yes, we can make some sort of numbers from there and put that into machinery, uh, but computer, it's, it's just doing some number with some work with numbers. It doesn't think about the meaning of the information that we are putting in there. So only we can understand and uh, what is behind that information and is it meaningful to multiply all that things and to calculate that values. Uh, so probably you will not want to put your categorical features, for example, uh, into linear regression or into support vector machine. And the same way you will probably not want to do that with PCA because it's this operation is really hard to give some meaning to that.
Thank you. Okay, anything else? Nope. Okay, then have a nice weekend and see you next Friday.